Hello everybody, nice to see you. As you probably, most of you probably watched our previous webinars uh, that were with uh, Dr. Berger from Australia and um, Dr. Jimenez uh, from, from Colorado. Uh, the previous webinars were uh, quite, I would say, a little bit theoretical in, in a sense, right? So we were talking about uh, why COVID is airborne, uh, what is the evidence behind it. Uh, Jose also shared a lot of, you know, materials there and, 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 and kind of giving arguments to why, why, why this, this is um, airborne, why the uh, COVID disease is airborne. And, and back then it was still kind of an ongoing debate, I would say, but now I would say the jury is finally in and, and, and now most, most uh, um, institutions actually do recognize that COVID is actually airborne. And this is why we have for today, we have, um, let's say, well, we will see how the conversation takes us, but we have a more uh, practical view of it. Um, we will be joined by, uh, by Professor uh, Angelo Ciribini, who is, who is um, a research fellow from, from University of Brescia. And he has uh, he has actually uh, worked firsthand um, in in a project that that has helped a, a school in Milan uh, to to actually um, implement a lot of a lot of these protocols for for co for airborne COVID and in general COVID protection. So he will talk about that um, in, in 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 more in more detail during the webinar. As always. Uh, this, this uh, webinar is brought to you by, by RNet4. Uh, in, by, by, at the end, I will uh, talk a little bit more about what, what is it. So as you see here on, on my table right here, this is the uh, nice RNet4 device, uh, the air quality sensor. And we have some news actually, since, since the last time we spoke, actually the design of RNet4 has been, I would say, greatly improved. So it looks like this now. So if you would order the RNet4 now, you would actually get this new and improved version of RNet4. So uh, I will talk about the differences and all of the benefits at the end. But so as promised for today, uh, I would like to uh, introduce you to Professor Angelo Ciribini. Um, hello, Professor. How are hello. you? Fine, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, Good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Depends yeah. on your own location podcast. We have a lot of people actually joining from United States as well. So it's oh. it's it's morning across the ocean and it's evening here. So thank you for uh, making your evening available for us. And uh, I know that you are probably uh, very busy. But uh, can you maybe uh, start with a little bit of history? So how, how did you get involved with this research? Um, what, what were the, the beginnings of it? Yeah, of course. <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, uh, together with some colleagues some years ago, um, I was uh, establishing a sort of uh, inter within the uh, my own university of Bosnia, uh, a sort of interdepartmental uh, uh, center called Ilax Lab, uh, which is based uh, within the Department of Information Engineering, and uh, we. We are investigating the topics uh, dealing with, for instance, smart grids, uh, smart buildings, uh, uh, namely cognitive buildings, uh, and maybe on the near future, semi-autonomous buildings, and so on. So, um, and after that, uh, uh, maybe on more recently, we did um, perform some uh, maybe research uh, activities dealing with uh, the predictive analytics um, aimed at uh, managing the, uh, for instance, the indoor air quality and the uh, CO2 uh, per related performances and, and values. And so <clears throat> when uh, the uh, maybe SARS, CO, V2 and COVID-19 
uh, issues uh, were sur surging on the last year uh, in Italy as well as uh, over the uh, world. Uh, the uh, maybe challenge of closing and reopening the schools uh, uh, did appear so relevant and so maybe controversial. And so we did start on the last, more or less on the last May, a research campaign, <clears throat> uh, maybe focused upon um, nursery, uh, um, kindergarten and the primary school uh, located in Milan. And uh, it, it uh, is involving more or less 200 pupils, kids and pupils. And uh, we did start from, of course, the built set because uh, we were um, performing a digital survey of the outdoor and indoor uh, environments and spaces. And so uh, <clears throat> we uh, did shape and configurate uh, uh, a building information model. So, uh, of course, we did uh, start from uh, the physical set. Right. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned that you, you started everything with this with schools when it was quite controversial. Could you uh, explain to the viewers maybe who don't know why, why was it controversial? Yeah, because uh, the uh, school <coughs> closures did happen uh, everywhere over the world, but uh, depending on maybe different uh, criteria, and uh, durations, uh, lengths, and so on. And for instance, Italy uh, <clears throat> was uh, closing the uh, schools uh, maybe uh, until the last September. And <clears throat> but I think that the controversial issues lies with the fact that the schools are uh, contrib uh, contributing or n or uh, not contributing to the widespread of the uh, viral particles and the contagion, of course. Uh, and so uh, we are uh, maybe just now reasoning about the following waves, uh, about how this could, could uh, contribute to the disease uh, and, and mainly to the contagion, because uh, the uh, children are uh, quite often uh, asymptomatic and so on. Hmm. So, do we do we see that uh, in in uh, statistically as well that in, in uh, for example in, in families where there are children that are going to school compared to uh, people who are just living in their homes with no children going to school do do they get sick more often? Yeah, but it's clear that maybe uh, the largest portion of the single infection did happen within the households. But it's clear that the school could uh, maybe uh, make easier the widespread, and it depends. But of course, I'm not um, a medical doctor, but a a anyway, uh, or an, a, cl a clinician or a, an epidemiologist. But I, I think that it's clear that uh, uh, within the school, some uh, super spreader uh, could uh, maybe. Uh, cause a lot of uh, damages and so on. Uh, and so, but it, it's clear that uh, the issue does remain uh, highly controversial and uh, the affair <clears throat> is intertwined uh, together with different maybe um, challenges, for instance, uh, about the uh, learn distance learning and so on, because many families are not so uh, happy to <clears throat> maybe uh, host uh, their own children, uh, who, uh, maybe when they are uh, following a, a distance learning program and so on. Okay, so due to this this whole fact, you chose uh, this this specific school in, in, in Milan. Uh, so could you maybe uh, s uh, talk a little bit about how was the setup of, 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 of this research? What, what did you implement? What, what, what happened there? Yeah, uh, of course, as I was uh, saying earlier on, our uh, maybe <clears throat> research, main research question and maybe also uh, our own uh, main re uh, value proposition uh, was staying with uh, the digital twinning. 
but uh, it's clear that uh, we uh, when uh, we have to come back to the last year on the last spring and uh, of course we are not so we uh, sorry uh, we uh, weren't so aware about the fact that uh, as professor Jimenez uh, is saying um, jobless drop and uh, aerosols float and so we were uh, maybe uh, trying and seeking at being focused upon, uh, for instance, um, the uh, physical distancing, the hand washing, and uh, the reshaping of the uh, classroom canti classrooms, canteens, uh, sport halls, uh, settings, layouts, and so on. And so, and so, please. Yeah, uh, you just mentioned something about digital twinning. So could you, I'm not sure that uh, the audience definitely yeah. understands what that means. So uh, maybe, and before you do, I, I want to remind our audience that you can also ask questions in the chat. Yeah. So we will have like about 20 minutes at the end where I'm going to go over these, uh, these questions. So if you find something you want to ask whilst we are speaking, go ahead, just write your question in the chat and we will try to address it at the end so go ahead digital twinning what exactly that yeah. is um the uh, notion of the digital twinning um maybe uh, was uh, maybe growing uh, some 20 years ago uh, at the university of michigan within the uh, maybe domain of the manufacturing industry because uh, it's a notion uh, quite close to the uh, product life cycle management uh, within the manufacturing industry. And quite recently, uh, the maybe a topic has been transposed uh, within our own uh, domain, the uh, construction uh, industry. And uh, it, it does mean that uh, you have, uh, of course, a physical built asset, uh, a digital replica of this uh, asset, and uh, mainly uh, maybe a um, bidirectional system of uh, receptors and actuator sensors um, nurturing uh, a sort of in data sets and uh, information flows um, aiming at um, uh, allowing a sort of car simulating uh, device for instance uh, maybe a computational model able to simulate uh, uh, various and different uh, conditions in order to uh, manage the built asset more effectively. Oh wow, so that's that's really interesting. So you have the actual setting, so in that classroom it would be like you have, yeah. you know, the real school, and then you make kind of a digital mock-up of it, so a 3D actual kind of place and then Absolutely. you kind of model things like airflow model you know people uh, going in and out and how how often they come into contact and then you kind of and how does that work so then you uh, run some kind of simulations and you compare that with reality and then you adjust your models or, or what is the process yeah there? yeah uh... Uh, it's correct. Uh, also, uh, maybe being focused upon uh, the uh, maybe the static settings, we were uh, maybe uh, trying to simulate the uh, users, uh, teachers, and students uh, flows and paths within the school. And for instance, we did uh, simulate uh, the uh, flows. Uh, dealing with the entrance to the school, uh, the egress and the flows coming uh, from, for instance, from the classrooms to the canteen, to the outdoor uh, spaces, uh, learning spaces and so on. And, and so we were simulating uh, not, not only maybe the uh, flows, but also uh, the behaviors of the users and occupants. Mm -hmm. because the occupancy is uh, maybe a crucial and a, a key uh, point and, and thing. Um, but of course, we uh, weren't uh, maybe able or nor available uh, to exploit some uh, uh, technologies dealing with the uh, image recognition and so on, because <laughs> it's a very maybe sensitive topic. But uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, 
we could figure out uh, to exploit such technologies on the need, on the maybe on the midterm, but uh, it's clear that uh, there is uh, uh, the uh, maybe concerns dealing with the GDPR and the other legal topics, uh, and of course. But uh, so uh, we were uh, maybe simulating by means of different uh, uh, packages um, the uh, crowd and individual uh, flows, as well as we were um, before the um, maybe reopening of the school uh, to be scheduled on the last September. Uh, we were we were also um, engaged in preparing a sort of uh, um, video game, uh, maybe aiming at uh, uh, trying to train uh, the uh, per prospective users to uh, follow different uh, procedures, protocols, and rules. A and video game. Wow, that's yeah, a really yeah. interesting approach. Yeah, yeah. So, can you talk a little it, bit more about that? Unfortunately, it, it was a sort of rough video game uh -huh. because of uh, uh, the lack of resources and uh, maybe time spent. But uh, anyway, we will uh, we we will try to enhance such a solution on the near future. And so, uh, the users uh, have been trained uh, on a virtual basis to uh, come back to the school because uh, um, maybe a largest part of them were uh, used to maybe uh, exploit and uh, operate the school but on uh, on the previous uh, criteria and so we, we did try to uh, maybe ex explain to them and their parents because uh, for instance uh, uh, before the COVID-19 uh, maybe period or age the parents were allowed to enter the old mm -hmm. of the school building but after that, uh, they, of course, uh, were <clears throat> not more allowed. They were forbidden. And so uh, um, I think that also the non-users uh, should uh, be aware of the protocols. So we are talking, this school is for like small children, right? It's kindergarten, yeah, yeah. From, preschool uh, maybe and all Maybe two years that. old to uh, 11 years old. So this, years. this also introduces kind of a layer of difficulty, right? So how do you yeah. explain uh, these sorts of protocols and, and to follow all these yeah. things for, for smaller children? So how do you do that? Uh, by, by means of uh, pictures, uh, and uh, also by means uh, throughout the video game, of course. Hmm. So you actually yeah. make all of the children play the video game, right? Yeah, but they, uh, their parents uh, uh, were also asked to fill some questionnaires and some, as well as the teachers hmm. and the head teacher too. And uh, so, uh, but, but of course, we were also uh, concerned with the uh, computation of the uh, air change uh, changes per hour. And so we did, um, by means of the building information model, we were able uh, to uh, maybe um, got uh, the, maybe the, um, so we were to get the uh, maybe uh, correct uh, right dimensions, uh, surfaces, uh, volumes, and so on. Because, for instance, we were also uh, by means of a semi uh, automated tool uh, to check the uh, physical distancing and so on uh, on a computational basis. And, and so we were uh, um, be able to um, make some. Uh, uh, computations about uh, the different rooms uh, and to maybe calculate the uh, needed air changes. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were um, not so persuaded uh, about uh, such a solution and so uh, we did start to investigate uh, the different computational model um, conceived in order to uh, assess the infection risk mainly by the aerosol transmission, uh, not only of course the uh, well-known uh, 
model uh, coming from uh, or devised by Professor Jimenez, but also um, also other uh, models. For instance, this one uh, coming from uh, prepared by the Max Planck Institute in Germany and so on. And so we were maybe trying to understand how the different uh, maybe uh, agents and factors could affect the um, assessment. Um, and for instance, I was uh, involving um, perhaps uh, five or six different uh, maybe universities, and uh, um, we are currently working together with, uh, um, for instance, um, pediatrician and uh, other uh, maybe uh, medical doctors. And, and so uh, maybe, for instance, uh, uh, um, pneumo pneumologists too. And, and so, so because, uh, yeah, because uh, for instance, within the algorithms um, involved within the uh, computational models, you have also to assess the viral quanta and they are depending on the tidal volume and respiratory frequency. Um, of the users of the occupants and so uh, we were trying together with the pneumologists and the pediatricians to maybe uh, deepen such um, parameters and, and so uh, after that of course we uh, were uh, maybe reaching the uh, need for uh, adopting some uh, sensor um, maybe frameworks and solutions and we did install uh, the uh, and and the IR uh, sensors uh, measuring co2 and um, relative humidity humidity within 14 classrooms and the canteen mm -hmm. and uh, after that because we are uh, maybe uh, investigating the smart buildings, we were able to establish um, maybe a, a, a connected system and we are able uh, to manage a sort of dashboard in order to on real time monitor, uh, of course, the values uh, within the different uh, environments, indoor environments. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you're you're uh, you're talking about very many of these you know different uh, values and different things to measure. What do you found that were like more? Imp what what were the more important ones? Um, it, it's clear that uh, by means of these sensors, the teachers uh, are and uh, were able to, for instance, uh, maybe. Um, manage the uh, windows openings mm -hmm. because the school has the maybe uh, largest part of the Italian school buildings are lacking uh, the uh, control mechanical uh, ventilation systems and so I think that the uh, windows opening uh, remain uh, remains the uh, maybe uh, the unique or the only uh, fourth uh, maybe solution and measure. And, and so um, we were uh, and we are able to monitor the maybe behaviors dealing with the, the um, windows opening in uh, uh, the different the various classrooms. But, but it's clear that we have to make some uh, distinctions uh, because uh, the uh, we did uh, meet uh, we met uh, um, maybe initially on, on the last uh, December after the installment uh, of the sensors we uh, met some entrances not uh, coming from the teachers and the students but uh, uh, maybe uh, stemming from uh, the parents uh, because. What were those? Because they were um, uh, quite and uh, hugely uh, concerned about uh, the uh, maybe fresh air, the cold air the during cold the air. winter time. And so uh, someone was saying to me, uh, you are trying to avoid that my child could be infected, but uh, uh, I feel that uh, he or um, she 
could uh, maybe uh, encounter uh, some other diseases and the pneumonia too on a, on a more traditional basis. And, <laughs> and we, so... we actually do hear quite a lot from like like this uh, because it's always kind of uh, a little bit uh, you know uh, juggling these things around, right? So. Uh, you know, also here, here in Latvia, what we've seen in schools is that we want to live, of course, in a perfect environment where we have, you know, <laughs> adaptive ventilation, everything is heated and all of that. But when you have a classroom of 30 children, right, there, everybody's breathing. So the CO2 level, it goes like to 1400 in like 15 minutes, you open the window in the middle of January and it gets really cold and it's kind of like juggling this. And there are a lot of people that are saying, you know, you know, I don't care about fresh, fresh air. I'm cold. I'm, I'm afraid that uh, I'm afraid that uh, that that, you know, something will will happen. So um, essentially, what do you say to people like that? <sighs> I think that um, it depends uh, on the uh, mindsets and the behaviors because I think that, for instance, in Italy, the parents are uh, maybe always quite concerned about uh, the uh, maybe um, open air and the outdoor environments, uh, not only over the winter time, uh, but also uh, in, uh, in the other seasons. And so I think that we have to maybe educate and train the parents, first of all. But um, So what do you say to them when you want to train them? Oh, the team uh, will turn maybe off in to, five minutes. To, to make them more aware of the benefits, not only from the uh, maybe uh, earth and safety related point of view, but also uh, looking at the uh, maybe learning, um, maybe potentials learning uh, improvements and so on, because it's clear that uh, uh, the um, indoor air quality is uh, maybe affecting, uh, if you are looking at the maybe uh, research findings coming from the Harvard School of right. Health, Public Health, uh, they are, uh, and, and also from the University of Salford in UK, some years ago, Professor Barrett was performing, performing a lot of very interesting uh, maybe research activities and it's clear that uh, the uh, maybe indoor air quality uh, should uh, um, allow uh, maybe to uh, improve the learning performances. So when, when, when you explain this to parents, do you typically find that they are more accepting of, of, of this or? Um, maybe uh, we, ha we have to check uh, such an assumption and to validate it, but um, I, I have, uh, I'm hoping so. And I, I have uh, maybe, um, I, I guess some doubts, but to be honest, but I, I think that uh, they could, uh, they have to make a sort of trade off. <laughs> That's Cause... true. But one thing is true that, you know, I think that COVID has really accelerated this discussion about air quality because beforehand, I think most people did not even like we, we, we were, you know, we were selling RNET also even before COVID. It's not just a COVID product, right? Uh, and we were talking about this specific Harvard research that you, that you mentioned actually, where they found that actually spending uh, time in, um, in, in, in environment where I think it was 1400 parts per million, your cognitive abilities decrease by half, right? And people, when they hear that, they, they don't believe it initially, uh, but... Yeah, but when I was, when I was not a child, but uh, maybe um, a lecturer uh, um, at the Politecnico di Torino, uh, I was uh, cooperating together with uh, some colleagues from Virginia Tech about healthy buildings and uh, indoor quality, and but maybe some uh, decades ago, and um, so it is not a, uh, an unprecedented topic, but it's clear that uh, we have the um, pandemic is accelerating the awareness, of course, and so uh, I think that. But um, uh, so uh, I think that we have also to uh, make uh, some other trade-offs because it's real that uh, unless the uh, mechanical ventilation um, 
is uh, or has been adapted. Um, it, it's clear that we have uh, to make some trade-off uh, between uh, the indoor, uh, the indoor, uh, the natural ventilation and the uh, energy efficiency mm -hmm. and consumption of the building. And so we are also trying to uh, maybe uh, realize how the uh, energy efficiency uh, could uh, worsen because of the <laughs> windows opening, for instance. But uh, we were also able on the last uh, years to d devise um, and to uh, perform a for instance, a prototype of the of an automated window, <laughs> but mm. and so uh, within the uh, concept of the digital twin, mm -hmm. we would able also to maybe um, you exploit the uh, automated uh, windows in order to uh, by means of some receptors uh, to open or close the window. But it's uh, of course only maybe a sort of provocative idea. But that would actually be a uh, cheaper solution, right? Because what is the alternative? Either you train, you know, the teachers to open the windows, which is, of course, you know, something that you are actually doing. Uh, then, you know, you have a mega huge investment, right, into building these mechanical automated ventilation systems, but something that would open a window could be like a midway for, 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 you know, especially these schools that are typically very tight on funding, right? Yeah, of course. But uh, you have also to take into account um, and consider uh, that, for instance, in, in Italy, the management of the built of the educational built assets are um, depending on, on the local authorities, mm. not on the uh, teachers or, or the Ministry of uh, Education. And so I think that uh, it could be quite difficult to manage the filters replacement and so on. Mm. I and so I, I think that the uh, mechanical ventilation could be quite useful, but not so easy to be managed over uh, midterm. Okay. So going back to this uh, school in Milan, so uh, COVID hit, so you started to implement also some kind of uh, protection measures. Some, uh, uh, can you talk a little bit a bit more about that? What was the protocol? What did you uh, tell to the teachers, to the children, to the parents? What what changed? Yeah, the uh, I think that the head teacher and the teachers were forced uh, to comply with the our own national uh, procedures and protocols, and they are very traditional. Um, for instance, in Italy, uh, there has been. Uh, um, a huge, uh, maybe, uh, and controversial to uh, debate about the desks because uh, the ministry was uh, buying a lot of uh, new desk, desks, um, maybe, uh, in, in order to make easier the physical di distancing. But uh, it's clear that, uh, of course, the protocols are, but anyway, the protocols were. Uh, um, obviously um, centered uh, uh, on uh, the uh, maybe traditional assumptions about the distancing and so they were a little bit neglecting uh, the aerosol transmission of course and so i think that uh, the protocols are uh, remaining a little bit uh, traditional dating back to the last year but um, and so uh, but i think that uh, apart from this the main uh, maybe challenge uh, and maybe the uh, more defined one depends uh, about how the uh, maybe uh, official and institutional uh, rules and constraints uh, uh, could be uh, complied with because the uh, rules and the behaviors are sounding quite different. And, and this is the reason why we did establish a sort of a monitoring campaign to be managed by the teachers about the uh, maybe actual behaviors of the students. So, so how was that implemented? What was done there? By means of some uh, questionnaires uh, to be filled on a digital way. Mm, so it's just like uh, qu questions about their behavior up until yeah, that yeah. point yeah, and yeah. then yeah, afterwards. Yeah. But let me say that uh, uh, the more 
critical behaviors are uh, maybe uh, to be uh, observed and checked uh, within the high schools, mm. not the primary school. Why is that? Because the uh, maybe the students attending the high schools are uh, persuaded that they are not uh, uh, maybe to be affected by the disease, uh, and so they are not feeling and they are not uh, maybe um, available to. Uh, comply with street rules. So, do you think this is kind of a bit of a failure in 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 the way that this these kind of things are communicated? Because I've also heard that you know, especially amongst teenagers, there's this kind of pervade, pervading illusion that you know we don't yeah. care about COVID because children don't die as much as older people do. That yeah, is sure. actually true. But it doesn't really mean that, you know, their behavior shouldn't change, right? Yeah, but we have to also to, uh, we have to remember also that there is the so-called long COVID. And so <laughs> the uh, maybe young people could uh, be affected affected by the long COVID too. But um, or, or, uh, as, um, as far as they could transmit uh, of course the virus but back to the uh, to their parents and relatives yeah. and and so on but um, no um, for, for instance i was discussing the issue together with some uh, high school professors and they were also trying to uh, maybe involve uh, from a scientific point of view uh, the their own students in, uh, in they were trying to maybe passionate them uh, and to make them more aware of the uh, maybe uh, issue of, of the phenomenon, but uh, they didn't succeed <laughs> quite often. Well, why not? Yeah, because they maybe the students they are they were and they are reporting me were not so interested. Oh. They, they are not fearing uh, the danger and so they are not so uh, risk adverse and so <laughs> I think that uh, it's so difficult to maybe persuade uh, such students and to involve them. But uh, coming back to the primary school, right. it uh, was uh, and it is uh, uh, more easy to manage uh, this uh, challenge. And so, but anyway, it's clear that the phenomenon is so complex. And for instance, uh, for the uh, aerosol um, uh, scientists and the uh, environmental engineers are um, always highlighting that the ventilation is not so uh, easy to be um, foreseen and managed, uh, even if uh, you are uh, maybe performing some um, CFD simulations and so on. And, and so so okay but so then in this case in these schools right uh there there were of course these 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 simulations and all of that but also you had uh, protocols uh, for the teachers and and the classrooms that were uh, monitoring the situation so how what what was the what were the suggestions there what what did they do yeah, um, first, of, um, first of all, I, I have to say that uh, uh, more recently we did perform some R sampling campaign because I think that we, we have uh, also to try to um, maybe trigger a sort of um, active surveillance. And for instance, uh, in Milan, uh, some colleagues of uh, the mine are um, coming from the School of Medicine are uh, maybe mm, starting to um, maybe to um, devise some saliva tests mm. uh, in order to uh, maybe um, perform an, an active surveillance system. And, but we are uh, trying to uh, maybe use the air samples and within the school, the uh, school, uh, the case, the school where we are performing our own investigations, we did perform a couple of uh, air, air sampling campaign uh, campaigns. And the first one just um, before the uh, new um, closure to be occurred on the on the last uh, end of uh, February 
and just uh, after the reopening some weeks ago. Mm -hmm. and, if, and luckily we didn't find any uh, maybe clues of virus. But, uh, and, and for instance, we are um, on the near future, we will uh, repeat such campaigns uh, within other schools, or also based in Milan and uh, within the um, emergency rooms of the hospitals. Mm. Okay. And so, and so, but for instance, uh, when uh, my colleagues were uh, performing the uh, air sampling, they were um, quite maybe supported by the uh, CO2 monitoring because they were uh, choosing this maybe the um, Envi indoor environment depending on the data sets coming from the sensors. So, and did you also implement some kind of uh, protocols for the teachers for the CO2 monitoring? So I understand you installed the CO2 monitors in yeah, the classrooms? We, we, we did try to, first of all, we did try to explain uh, to them uh, how these sensors uh, are uh, maybe performing and how to be aware of the alerts and warnings. Because mm -hmm. of course we did establish these thresholds according to the international standards. And what and are so, they? So for those who do not know, uh, what are um, the thresholds for, for CO2 values? Yeah, to, to be honest, to be honest uh, during the winter period, we were trying to uh, making some uh, compromises, and so we did fix the threshold, the maybe main threshold at uh, uh, 100 ppm. But uh, but more recently, uh, we we uh, did lower the threshold to the uh, um, seven or eight hundred ppm. It's more, it's more correct, but uh, it's clear that we have, we had to, um, may, to make some compromises because uh, the concerns of the parents and so. Of course, it's it's always about compromises, right? But if you don't really monitor at all, it, it just goes up to two thousand, and then it's not good. So, yeah, and no. what, what what is kind of the instructions for the teachers, right? So, what what do they do? They uh, do they have to look at the device, or do they have like audio warnings, or do you also involve? Like... No, uh, we were uh, recommending to the teachers to look at the devices, but uh, it's interesting to. Uh, maybe a remark that uh, uh, there were the pupils uh, quite often uh, really um, sensitive and uh, th they were so careful to maybe um, monitor <laughs> the values and they were uh, uh, signaling to the teachers that the thresholds um, were uh, trespassed and so on. Mm, okay, so and that also kind of helps, right? So because that that also teaches the children themselves, and they they can uh, take that knowledge and because the the teacher. So what what kind of is is kind of like the teacher already has to do a lot, right? He he and sh he or she has to lead the lesson, and if she or he has to follow the CO two readings. It's another thing, and then their teachers like, oh, how many of those things, right? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. O originally, they were a little bit bored because they were concerned to be minded away from their main tasks and duties. But I think that they were um, more and more um, used, and maybe um, they were learned. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and so I, I, I think that. Uh, but anyway, I think that there were the students uh, quite uh, maybe capable of uh, stimulating the teachers to <laughs> someone, of course. Okay. So this is like this is about this specific project, right? So you have all these yes. uh, researchers at at your disposal, and you are you know monitoring both CO two modeling schools and all of that. And this is a very lucky school, so to stay because <laughs> because of all of this, you know they are safer. But 
how can this be taken like if if there are people you know we have we had a lot of you know teachers and, and headmasters register from other schools so what would be your kind of suggestions uh, what were the main things that you learn what what can some people that don't have you know a university background what are the main things that they can implement in their schools yeah um I have also to say that the school uh, was suffering a few quarantines and so we could be um, really effective in, perform in accomplishing and achieving our own purposes. But uh, I think that there are some very interesting contributions. For instance, uh, this one um, co-authored by Deepti Gurdasani. Uh, it's a correspondence published by the Lancet some weeks ago. There were, of course, there, there are, of course, the uh, maybe papers coming from the Harvard Public Health School, and um, there are other contributions quite recently published by the Lancet, and um, and so I think that. Um, uh, but I think that the uh, ultimate rationale of the measures to be enforced um, are um, maybe based on a, a multi-layered approach. It's clear that apart from the sensors, uh, I think that uh, uh, maybe um, the combination of different measures are really effective, uh, including the uh, vaccine, of course. Mm -hmm. So. What, what? Because in Italy, for instance, the largest portion of the teachers uh, um, has been uh, uh, for the first dose uh, already um, vaccinated. They did receive uh, the first shot. Oh, but uh, for instance, in Israel, uh, they are maybe uh, waiting for uh, vaccinate the uh, students um, whose age is under 16. Mm -hmm. And so. Okay. But I don't know in Italy uh, what could be the uh, final decision about such a topic. But I, I think that uh, the uh, multi-layered approach uh, should uh, work really on a, an effective manner. So what do you mean by multi-layered approach? Uh, to, to be compliant with different uh, um, measures, for instance, uh, of course, uh, uh, the mask wearing, uh, the physical distancing and the washing, uh, of course, the indoor air quality and, and and maybe also to exploit the outdoor learning spaces. Oh, okay. So exploiting the outdoor learning spaces, that's that that also really, yeah, this, that does help. But that also brings even more, uh, of course, this this issue of, of, of cold environment. <laughs> Right. Yeah, of course. But it depends on the on the mindsets and the behaviors, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what is like? What are the main things that that you have learned from your own research? Uh, I think that um, we have also to uh, look at the past pandemic. Uh, age, mm -hmm. because I, I think that uh, it's clear that uh, may, for, for instance, the um, maybe and aware uh, viral rational is forcing the uh, schools uh, and the maybe the head teachers and the teachers to uh, strengthen the idea of the uh, teacher centrism and uh, so it's clear that the protocols are urging and forcing to uh, maybe um, uh, strengthen the idea of a, a static uh, ways uh, of uh, teaching and learning center on the classroom mm, but i think it's clear that the uh, most innovative uh, may be mainly dealing with the primary school and uh, it's clear that the most innovative uh, may be uh, lear learning uh, methodology teaching and learning methodologies are centered about the idea of breaking the classroom and so, for instance, to mix the uh, different um, uh, ages and, and, and classes and, 
And so uh, to, to avoid the bubbles, for instance, but mm. it's clear that the rationale of the viral transmission is forcing to uh, establish bubbles, restraints, constraints, uh, and to avoid any interactions between different uh, uh, groups of people, students, and so on. So I think that we have to to try to uh, reason about the legacy of the uh, pandemic and mm. to try to uh, look uh, at a sort of um, uh, preparedness uh, indicator uh, to be applied to the buildings after the pandemic. For instance, the European Commission uh, was establishing the so-called SRI, the Smart Readiness Indicator for mm. buildings, and uh, it's an indicator dealing with the maybe uh, digital capabilities in order to make the buildings more uh, efficient from the uh, clean energy point of view. And so I think that we could try to devise a, a similar indicator dealing with the uh, future pandemic, uh, maybe preparedness and uh, above all, uh, I think that it could be an overarching item in, in order to uh, make the school buildings uh, healthier. So this would be kind of like a score based on, you know, all the yeah. possibilities that the building is doing. And based on yeah. that, you can devise some kind of, you know, suggestions so you can improve here. This is what you can do. This is, you yeah. know. But absolutely, but uh, I think that uh, the idea of the digital twin to be implemented within the school uh, communities, not only the school buildings, um, could be perceived also as a sort of uh, behavioral device. Because if you are looking at the idea of, uh, uh, for instance, smart home or the helpful home, uh, maybe um, promoted by uh, Amazon or Google and so on, it uh, could work as a sort of behavioral device. And it's clear that, for instance, um, the European uh, Union and the European Commission is quite concerned about um, the uh, digital sovereignty. And for, for instance, uh, the, uh, I, I am uh, uh, mentioning the uh, recent act about the artificial intelligence and so on. So I, I think that uh, when uh, we are looking at the uh, connected the built set it's clear that we are looking also at the uh, maybe surveillance uh, uh, dealing with the users and uh, of course the teachers and the um, students and so on. So I, I think that we have to be cautious but also to be uh, valuable to maybe manage some uh, uh, future uh, and ongoing perspectives but also to maybe inherit uh, the most suitable uh, legacy from the pandemic. Uh, yeah. Okay, no, that's, 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 that's really valuable. So we are kind of nearing the end of our time. So yep. let's go to some questions that, uh, that uh, people have asked here. So uh, let me just uh, cycle. So there are a lot of people saying hi. Uh, let me see something in Italian. Okay, so maybe uh, the Italian questions can be answered later on i'm gonna not uh, try to put this <laughs> into okay so here's there's uh, giovanni is asking something in english so is there a satisfactory alternative to mechanical ventilation or window opening especially for the winter months it's a hard question to be answered because i think that uh, the mechanical ventilation could be uh, really performing but it does need uh, maybe a, a logistical uh, system because uh, in, um, in Italy, for instance, I was uh, saying earlier on there is a sort of divide between uh, the local authorities and the uh, maybe um, uh, head teachers and so on. So it oh. depends on the countries. Uh, it, it, it really does depend. Okay, I guess all the rest kind of there's there's quite a conversation going on in the comments, but it's mostly in Italian, so uh, we'll yeah. have to address it afterwards. But we're also kind of nearing nearing the the end of of this webinar, so I'm just gonna ask the the final question, like, what would be this 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 kind of maybe some um, final suggestion for everybody? 
um, what 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 do you you know what do you suggest for for people to to, to keep safe until the end of maybe the, yeah. in the semester until we get uh, get the vaccine so what what are your main kind of suggestions and what do you want to leave our audience with yeah. but uh, apart from uh, going um, outdoor and uh, of course opening the windows i, I think that um, the idea of uh, censoring the indoor environments does mean uh, that uh, you have to be more aware of the um, space usage uh, and i think that uh, um, for, for instance uh, there, there are some uh, iconic pictures uh, not only uh, refer to the Italian uh, scenario, uh, dating back to the last year. And uh, it's clear that when you are looking at a teacher or a head teacher uh, measuring uh, by means of a traditional uh, meter the distance between the desks, you are, or, or um, maybe trying to uh, re review and revise the um, timetable of the lessons, you are uh, maybe starting to realize that the space uh, uh, has to be uh, maybe understood as a very important uh, matter. And so uh, I think that not only within the school buildings, but for instance, uh, with also within the offices and uh, elsewhere, um, I think that uh, you are uh, to maybe to be uh, to uh, you, you have to accept the idea that the uh, space is uh, for instance uh, we work is saying that uh, you, you they can provide space as a service and so i think that uh, mm -hmm. the uh, space is uh, maybe a very important value but for instance the um, I, I was hearing some uh, real estate developers uh, they were who are saying that uh, they have to emphasize and maybe also to sell the value of the air, <laughs> the value of the air. And for instance, the idea of uh, sharing the air or rebreathing the air, right. uh, it, it, I think that it could be it could sound as a very um, um, sensitive and crucial legacy. Huh, because I, I fear that the pandemic will uh, end uh, on the uh, near future, but I think that uh, we have to gain some, uh, uh, maybe uh, to some interesting perspe perspectives, and I think that we we, uh, we have not to lose uh, the inheritance. Uh, I think that it's clear that uh, uh, the people who would uh, maybe uh remove the uh such a stressing uh period but i, I think that uh, the legacy has to be uh valued not uh, to is not a, a forgettable uh maybe period that... we have not to lose <laughs> the inheritance yeah that's that's actually a an interesting way of looking at it so air the air in the building is something that we uh, all share and it's our own common resource so let's think about you know taking care of the air that we breathe you know together yeah. right yeah, okay. because if you are looking at the aerosol scientists for them the uh, sharing of the air is a trivial idea but for uh, me uh, the uh, users uh, it's not so uh, true and so I think that we have to gain a more awareness of the value of the air. <laughs> that is that is a very good message to to actually end this on. Professor Cherubini, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for educating our, you know, uh, audience and and I hope that a lot of people will go away from this smarter and you know can use this also to to help to spread the word. And, uh, and yeah, thanks a lot for your time this evening. Thanks uh, to you too, of course. See you soon. See you. Good luck with your research. Thank you. Oh, thank you Bye. very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.
everybody thank you very much for listening today i saw that there were a, a couple of questions that came afterwards and we're gonna try to answer them afterwards uh, as well uh, they will be probably in in, in the comments or or in the uh uh, appendix of this uh, of this of this uh, recording this recording will as always be available on our website um, afterwards there will be an edited version everybody who was registered will 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 of course receive follow-up emails so uh, just to kind of uh, remind you this this whole uh, webinar was brought to you by Aronet, which is this uh, lovely air quality sensor that can be uh, used also in this uh, pandemic uh, in this pandemic environment we have now also a uh, better design so right so uh, now 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 the design was is improved with larger numbers it also shows you uh, this uh, this this uh, this kind of um, traffic light indicator is a lot more uh, clearer visible here and in general I think it looks a lot uh, nicer also I want to mention our nice uh, partners here Elpor who have given us this nice uh, wall of plant that is decorating and also helping with the air here in our Aronet studios so you can see them at alpua.com so that is it for uh, today thank you everybody uh, for watching and uh, I wish you all uh, great health and endurance and soon uh, all of hopefully all of you will get vaccinated and this will be over soon so thank you very much goodbye